Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, just uh, give a minute or two here for people to uh, trickle in out of the Zoom waiting room, but uh, welcome to today's uh, GOC, final GOC uh, session here. We'll get started in just uh, a minute. Jennifer, maybe I'll get you to put yourself on mute. To... Oh, of course, yeah. All right, it's uh, two thirty-one. I'll try to get uh, get us started on time here, even if we don't finish that way. Um, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Stuart Oak. I am the program manager at the Organic Council of Ontario. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's final uh, Guelph Organic Conference session entitled Regenerative Organic Certification and Organic 3.0. Uh, it's a bit of a wordy title, but I'm very excited for the content of today's session. Uh, but uh, before we, we get into it and I introduce our speakers, I would first uh, like to make a, a land acknowledgement. Uh, we'd like to start um, by first acknowledging that the sacred land where the Organic Council of Ontario resides, as well as the traditional home of the Guelph Organic Conference, is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We'd ask that you take a moment to reflect on where you yourself are situated and the history of the lands you now occupy. We welcome you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat today at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to learn the history of the land you are in relationship with by, uh, with by visiting whose land and native land, uh, .ca, and we'll share those links in the chat for those of you who would like to learn more about uh, the land in which you're residing. Uh, a couple notes about how to participate in today's uh, Zoom webinar uh, session. No, I know many of you are familiar uh, with this format, uh, but for those of you that aren't, or for those of you who are joining us for the first time uh, this, uh, this week, we invite everyone to introduce themselves in the session chat located on the right-hand side of your webpage. Uh, you make sure your chat audience is set to everyone uh, when you're sending messages in the chat and not just to panelists. There will be time to ask speakers questions uh, after our presentations today, so we'd ask that you hold uh, those questions until then. Uh, but when the time does come to ask questions, there are two ways to do so. Uh, one, uh, you can write your questions in the Q&A box, different than the chat box, which is also located at the bottom of your presentation screen. Uh, you can add questions here, and it's very helpful uh, for you to put them in the Q&A box for us because it makes it easier for us to uh, keep those questions organized and make sure nobody gets forgotten. You can also uh, use the raise hand button to indicate uh, that you would like to ask your question live uh, during the Q&A portion of the session. Uh, and then we will un unmute you and you can ask your question and uh, be able to get more than a few voices involved in the conversation today. Uh, we are very fortunate to have these presenters share their knowledge and experience with us, as well as the community of attendees that have joined our session today. So we ask that you all please communicate respectfully, both in the chat and in the Q&A box uh, with all the participants today. Um, some information about the Organic Council of Ontario. OCO is the voice for organics in Ontario. We're a membership-based nonprofit association that represents Ontario's organic sector. OCO is the only trade association working and advocating on behalf of the entire organic industry from field to plate. Our membership includes all certified organic operators, uh, but supporting members are a main source of our revenue and also receive benefits. If you would like, uh, if you like the work that we do and you believe in a strong local organic food system, please consider becoming a member of the Organic Council today. For updates on OCO and organic agricultural news, resources, funding opportunities, green jobs, and more, you can sign up for our e-news uh, on, on our website. We'll also share the link for that in the chat. OCO's uh, AGM is also March 31st of this year, and we are currently recruiting board members. So please see the chat for, for link to the nomination forms for uh, our board members. Definitely looking for people who, who care about the organic sector in Ontario to, to join, so please don't be shy. 
Uh, finally, uh, this year's conference theme uh, was inspired by OGO's Organic Climate Solutions Campaign. Throughout this campaign, uh, which is funded by the Government of Ontario's Climate Action and Awareness Fund, we want to raise awareness of the environmental and economic benefits of organic and regenerative farming practices and the resources available to support farmers in taking up these practices. You can use uh, the link uh, once again in the chat to explore the Organic Climate Solutions webpage. Also, uh, I'd like to take a quick moment to uh, thank an important person to the Guelph Organic Conference. Uh, we'd like to thank Tomas Nemo for his 40 plus years of commitment to the organic sector and his long standing work on the Guelph Organic Conference, uh, which has been an important meeting place for the sector over its many years of growth. But that is not to say Tomas was, uh, was still a big part of planning this year's uh, conference. Uh, he helped in partnership with, with OCO, and while OCO is hosting this year's virtual conference, the conference will continue as it, here, as it has in years past, once we are back in person, hopefully soon. Um, and, uh, and finally, uh, the Guelph Organic Conference would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. Thank you to all of those sponsors. Thank you to our growth level sponsors, Yorkshire Valley Farms and EcoCert, and our flourish level sponsors, Fennings Organic Farm, ProCert Organic Systems, and Canadian Organic Growers, uh, the Prairie Organic Development Fund, and the Government of Canada. We would like to offer a special thank you to this, uh, this session's uh, sponsor in particular, which is EcoCert, uh, and I would pass the baton, the speaking baton, over to Jennifer Brom, who has to say a few words, and then we have a video from EcoCert. Jennifer, I'll just get you to unmute yourself there. I'm just going to get oh, started. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I think, am I on there now? Yeah, you are. We can hear you, Jennifer. You, you've managed it. I don't know what happened. I could see it, but it wouldn't let me. Anyways, sorry about that. So um, they're going to play a little video for you all just to see a little bit about EcoCert. But part of the reason why EcoCert's done this um, video is that this year is our 30 year anniversary. And so it's um, been awesome because they've been really doing like a whole speaker series and really informing even the staff of EcoCert the types of things that we do globally. So it's been great even as an employee of EcoCert, but I think also this um, little video just gives you a little insight into the direction that EcoCert is trying to go. We do more than just organic certification, we do climate and a variety of others, which I'll mention later. All right. Hey, Jamie, I'm not getting any sound on Their commitment year after year for more than 30 years. A conviction that raises our awareness of everything around us, that changes our mindsets. A conviction that encourages us to work together and brings meaning to our everyday actions. A conviction that guides us to foster an in-depth transformation towards more responsible production and consumption systems, more respectful of living ecosystems, and to mitigate climate change, to make the organic sector grow for healthier, more environmentally friendly food, to support fair trade supply chains that offer decent working conditions, to encourage the choice of eco-design, innovation, and green chemistry, and to promote the use of organic, natural, and recycled ingredients. EcoCert provides support for those committed to the transition towards a sustainable world. Pioneer in the organic sector in the 1990s, EcoCert now brings several decades of experience on the ground with producers, organizations, and businesses via its network of experts located throughout the world. Our missions to guarantee, to ensure traceability, 
to build trust, to adopt and to encourage the implementation of the best environmental and social practices, to identify global issues and find sustainable local solutions so that every individual at their own level and in their own region can contribute to a balance between human activity, the preservation of natural resources, and biodiversity. With the genuine conviction that it takes commitment today to secure the future of the generations to come. EcoCert. Act for a sustainable world. Perfect. Thank you to EcoCert for that video and Jennifer for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, our session today um, was uh, inspired <laughs> through a conversation OCO staff had uh, after listening to uh, a conversation that I know many of you will have heard and have participated in, which is one of regenerative agriculture. And we wanted to have a conversation today to explore the ways in which organic certification in this conversation around uh, regenerative agriculture fit into each other and, and what uh, what that word regenerative means, um, both in the context of uh, the regenerative organic certification uh, that Jennifer is here to talk about, and also just uh, more broadly about how these uh, general climate friendly growing solutions fit into organic production in the Canadian organic regime and, and how we can continue uh, to help the Canadian organic standards evolve in a way that encompasses uh, these practices uh, when it doesn't already. So uh, with that brief um, explanation, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker today. Uh, Andy Hammermeister is the director of the Organic Agriculture Centre of Canada uh, and uh, an associate professor in the Faculty of Agriculture at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. After growing up on a mixed grain and beef operation in Saskatchewan, he completed his uh, bachelor's in agriculture uh, from the University of Saskatchewan, his master's in land reclamation and PhD in applied ecology at the University of Alberta. Uh, and he has worked with the OACC since 2002, collaborating in research on grain, vegetable and fruit cropping systems, exploring soil fertility and weed management. Most recently, he's been studying uh, small bush fruits uh, such as Hascap, uh, landscape biodiversity and applications of smart technologies to organic agriculture. He's also the science director for the Organic Science Cluster, uh, the coordinated national initiative for organic agricultural research in Canada, where he leads the National Organic Research Priority Setting Coordination and Impact Assessment. Andy, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much. I, I got to shorten that intro. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll just uh, fire up my screen share here. I oh, just had a bunch of comments over go over my screen. Can am I sharing screen now? Yes, looks great. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be coming to you from Mi'kma'ki, the um, ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia area. And uh, definitely a, a great, uh, I, I'm so happy to be part of the Guelph Conference and uh, uh, happy to be part of this conversation, though I'm really looking forward to the discussion later because I'm sure I'll learn as much as I can offer here today. So I'm going to start by talking about a little bit more about Organic 3.0 and uh, the general concept of regenerative agriculture, and then Jennifer will be getting more into the regenerative organic certification. And so I, I like to go back to our founding pioneers of the organic movement and, and thinking a little bit about what uh, they mean to us and, and what they were thinking in terms of the organic movement. And, and really the likes of uh, Steiner, Howard, Balfour and Rodale were all really interested in supporting healthy soils to support healthy plants and healthy ecosystems, um, but ultimately to have healthy livestock and people. And you know, this is very much the narrative of regenerative agriculture now as well. You see, you hear that connection between healthy soils and healthy crops and nutritional uh, crops for healthy people all the time. 
Um, I think ultimately they were hoping to see a productive and profitable and environmentally farming system as part of their goals. And um, certainly the success of the organic movement really led to um, uh, greater awareness among consumers in terms of the demand for um, products that were being described as organic. And it also started to generate some market interests. And uh, as the, this market started to grow, we needed to provide consumers with more assurances um, relating to uh, that the, the, the standards of organic agriculture or the expectations of organic agricultural production systems were being met. And so that uh, really stemmed into the formation of the of IFOM, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements in 1970. And uh, that led to the evolution of standards and regulations uh, within countries and beyond, and of course, equivalency agreements. And we're largely in this realm of uh, organic 2.0 uh, now, um, as the, the market has been growing tremendously in organic. And, and certainly, um, while there is a, a, a pressing um, movement from the producer side, uh, I definitely would argue that uh, there's the market demand and the consumer demand is really an important driving force in organic right now. And perhaps that's a good thing or maybe not, and we can talk about that more. Um, I think if we look at where we came to in Organic 2.0, I really like um, showing this pedal diagram that was produced by Sofort and Raman Kuti when they did a review of the outcomes of organic agriculture compared with conventional farming systems. And really um, uh, what this diagram is showing is they're, they're comparing um, conventional systems. So this red circle that you see here is the conventional kind of norm or standard. There's 26 different indicators of performance out here, each petal representing one indicator. And uh, the darker the shade of the petal, um, the, uh, the more reliable the information is. So if you see it kind of gray or faded, then uh, there's not as good data around some areas, indicators. Um, I really like how they've summarized this in this way, and I won't go through every single indicator individually, but it really shows that um, how we should be taking a multifunctional lens when we're thinking about agriculture, that we're not just trying to achieve a single thing like avoiding pesticide residues or only uh, sequestering carbon or only being profitable for farmers and so on. We need to be taking this multifunctional view. So certainly um, the different colors of the petals represent different categories of, uh, of indicators. And so here we have the producers side of things in kind of purplish red. And uh, obviously we're concerned about profitability and low exposure to um, uh, farmers. And obviously as the organic movement has evolved and developed, uh, the producer benefits are really important. Of course, producers are also very interested in yield that uh, influences profitability often. And uh, it also um, uh, helps with conversations in the coffee shop, so to speak. And, uh, and of course, we want to be meeting um, uh, global food requirements. We also have the consumers up here in kind of the purpley blue area and consumers have certain expectations for outcomes that we would be wanting to achieve from organic, including low pesticide residues and improved nutritional value in foods. But then of course comes the more environmental or ecological goals of uh, the farming system. And they are, there's a number of these goals for sure. And uh, ultimately we have increasing expected outcomes from that. With the regenerative agriculture movement, we're seeing more and more interest in some of these environmental targets. So um, one of the questions that we need to think about so far, our organic standards are really developed around a process oriented uh, around process uh, in our production system and not necessarily outcomes. We don't target the outcomes specifically. However, we do have some expected outcomes from the farming system. And uh, are we achieving those? And uh, that's, that's a really interesting question. But ultimately, we, we need to have a unique value proposition that organic is offering uh, consumers as well as producers and policymakers if we want to distinguish ourselves. So that leads us to a discussion about organic 3.0. And uh, do we need to move into uh, next stage in the evolution of organic agriculture? 
And um, really, when you look at the, the global situation that we're in, there's many global challenges that uh, we need to deal with. Agriculture is a contributor to many of these challenges that are shown in the graphic, but it's also can be an important solution to many of these problems. Um, organic agriculture, certainly, as you can see from that previous petal diagram, can be a solution or contributing to the solution to many of these challenges. The problem, though, is, is that organic is not growing fast enough. And, you know, and even if you look at the statistics for um, organic acreage in the world, about two thirds of that acreage is coming from low input uh, production systems such as permanent grassland. So are we really converting the land uh, that is most um, that's experiencing the highest level of input use and perhaps the highest environmental risk? Um, uh, organic is being seen as a, as a conclusive goal um, rather than something that is continuously evolving by many. So you get that organic status and then you can mark it and you're good to go. Um, you know, there's lots of challenges in the organic sector around accessibility of the regulated standards, especially for small scale producers in developing countries and how do we deal with that. Um, organic has this identity, you're either in or you're out, and, um, and that really puts people on either side of a spectrum, and that limits growth and creates some stigma around organic as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, perhaps as the market grows, is organic really being market driven now instead of being driven by our principles, and do we risk uh, diluting our uh, principles? And is organic um, um, really achieving fair pricing for all throughout the entire value chain, including uh, consumers uh, right through to producers, back to the producers? So those are big issues that we need to deal with. And ultimately, that's what led to Organic 3.0. The global visionaries of the organic movement are trying to deal with the issues that I just described. And uh, they've tried to capture them in this Organic 3.0 document. So Organic 3.0 is described as a revised understanding and positioning towards more ambitious and common good goals, and therefore has a strong focus on the spirit, attitudes, values, and strategic plans of the stakeholders inside and outside of the organic movement. So interesting wording there. Um, so if we take a look inside the document, and I'm gonna focus on these six um, features of Organic 3.0 up here. Um, I'm going to start with uh, number one, which is a culture of innovation. So we're supposed to be continuously improving and innovating in our practices. And that leads very well to the second feature of Organic 3.0, which is continuous improvement towards best practice. Um, the next one I want to, uh, there's, uh, we can't cover all of these in detail, but uh, kind of highlighting in this presentation, um, we also want to be inclusive of wider sustainability interests. So this is being deliberate that we connect with other organizations that uh, are also supporting sustainability goals that are similar to organic. And lastly, we have this uh, concept of true value and fair pricing and, and even the holistic empowerment from farm to final consumer links to that concept of fairness. So ultimately, we want organic to be driving, um, be, being a leader in the evolution of, of agriculture overall, and that will identify practices that and enhance sustainability that uh, all of agriculture can um, capture as well, so that we can have impact on those global issues. So where does regenerative agriculture fit? And when we go back to um, where regenerative came from, it really has five lineages. It, um, that include the regenerative paradigm, um, which goes back to the 1970s, this whole concept, which I'll introduce in a little bit more in a moment. Um, we have the Rodale organic uh, uh, approach, holistic management from Alan Savory, then we have permaculture, and then we have the, more of the USDA um, uh, cover cropping, soil profits, NRCS uh, type approach. So all of these Basically, you have all these groups or associations that are recognizing that agriculture needs to move towards a higher sustainability uh, status, uh, status, and that our current practices are either keeping us just kind of at a minimum and not really moving us in a positive direction and improving our ecological outcomes. So it really is this combination of groups that led to what regenerative agriculture is now. 
Um, there's no clear consensus on the definition of what regenerative agriculture might be. Um, different people will throw different, different definitions out. If you look at the word regenerative, it means renewal or restoration of a biological system after injury. And I kind of paraphrase that a little bit from Miriam Webster. But um, some of the definitions in, tend to lean towards something like a set of planned agricultural practices that ensure the holding is not depleted and over time the soil, water, air, and biodiversity are improved or maintained to the greatest extent. So that's a distinction between sustainable and regenerative. Regenerative means you're actually improving things. Sustainable means you're allowing things to at least persist indefinitely. So a little definition. Now, speaking of definitions, the word define comes from the word uh, Latin verb de, uh, which means completely, and finer to bound or limit. So the word define actually means to completely set a limit to something. And so this is really interesting, and I'll tell you why. Because the original regenerative agriculture paradigm did not want to define and set limits to what regenerative agriculture should be. Um, they actually wanted to see agriculture be this continuous improvement of the land and the, our relationship with the land. And so they did not specify a clear definition of what regenerative was. And they wanted to see us moving from this basics of key functional best practices, which is a lot of what we'll talk about in regenerative ag now, through um, working with whole ecosystems, ecosystems of enterprises, and then ultimately a whole paradigm shift in what agriculture should be. So a really interesting reading about the original regenerative agriculture paradigm. Uh, Regeneration International is one of the big international organizations that's really captured that regenerative paradigm and is trying to promote that paradigm as a whole shift uh, in thinking about agriculture. Um, but, the, you know, so this has captured the interest and the spirit of many different groups within agriculture, including companies like PepsiCo and General Mills. Um, and I, I've used General Mills as an example here, and General Mills has uh, identified six core principles of regenerative agriculture, ranging from minimizing soil disturbance, maximizing crop diversity, keeping the soil covered, maintaining living roots year round, and integrating livestock. Now, interestingly, depending upon, because there's no clear definition or standard, regulated standard around regenerative, um, some regenerative principles would not have maintaining living roots year round, they might have no synthetic chemicals there instead. So depending on who you're with. Interesting addition to uh, General Mills um, uh, principles are the understanding and context of your farm operation. So recognizing that your farm, uh, depending upon what kind of landscape or what kind of community you're in or market you might have access to, um, that might shape how you approach regenerative agriculture. So it gives you some flexibility there. They um, target measuring impact across uh, resiliency, soil health, water quality, biodiversity, and some animal welfare goals. And obviously, we don't have time to get into all of these in detail. But they largely work on this through a process of self-assessment. So they have different levels um, of participation in regenerative, and, uh, uh, and farmers are asked to go through this self-assessment process to identify their uh, status. Uh, but there's other approaches, uh, interests in regenerative agriculture certification, and you go to private companies like this that actually don't publish their standards online. Uh, you have to become a member or uh, in interact with them directly to get those standards. But they're kind of putting their own twists on what regenerative might mean. So ultimately, that leads us to regenerative organic certified, and uh, that's what Jennifer is going to be talking about. So I'm not going to delve into that in any detail. But just to kind of conclude my presentation, I think that Organic 3.0 is definitely has some alignment with the regenerative organic certification and uh, some consistency with uh, some of the, the goals of or principles of what regenerative agriculture is trying to achieve. But regenerative ag is still a very much evolving concept. Um, it's a great entry point for new producers to get into that level one and do the very basics of uh, regenerative practices. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still a long ways away from uh, organic uh, status uh, at that minimum level. 
And essentially when we start applying regenerative to organic, we are basically stacking systems and we're, we're taking re organic certification to a whole new level. So um, I'm, I'm excited in some ways about the discussions about regenerative agriculture as uh, Brent Preston mentioned in his uh, opening remarks or in his keynote presentation on Monday, he was talking about regenerative moving everyone in the right direction. So there's definitely issues, but it actually gets people moving in the right direction. So hopefully we can form um, some sort of relationship between organic and uh, 3.0 vision um, with the regenerative movement as well. But let's hear what Jennifer has to say about it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andy, for that uh, that nice uh, segue uh, to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Jennifer uh, Brom is with EcoCert Canada as part of their client services uh, department, and she will be speaking on the regenerative organic certification that uh, EcoCert has just begun uh, quite recently in certifying uh, Ontario and Canadian farmers too. Jennifer, welcome. Thanks so much, and I I figured out my mute this time, so we can just move right <laughs> into it. <laughs> okay, so as mentioned, I am Jennifer, and um, I have been working for EcoCert for 10 years now. I work in the Saskatoon office. As some of you may know, we also have office in Guelph, and then we have another one in Quebec City. I did want to just briefly touch on the fact that um, although EcoCert is probably known best in Canada for organic certification and, and now hopefully regenerative, that we do actually do globally over 150 different standards. And so it's those standards as well that we also want to promote sometimes because they're beyond just organic. Because uh, as you could tell from the little video, EcoCert is uh, really passionate about climate change and, and trying to change the world for the better and help with, you know, uh, helping people to realize what they could do to mitigate climate change. And I do think organic farming is one of those things. So we do carbon neutral, we've got global gap, HACCPs, uh, Cosmos, Fair for Life, Food Safety, Rainforest Alliance. We can do Korean and Chinese certifications. And then, of course, on top of that, many more. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about regenerative. And if I could have the next slide, please. So, um, oh, sorry. Why we want to talk about regenerative? There seems to be many reasons consumer demands, organic farmers looking for a more robust standard soil health, social fairness are all part of the reasons why people are interested. Um, this is a quote that CODA provided on, based on their market research and sustainable practices and fair labor appears to be the most important thing with consumers, specifically the younger generation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what does regenerative ag stand for? Soil health, is intrinsically linked to the total health of our food system. Soil health affects everything from the planet's health to human well being and the future of our planet. Regenerative prioritizes soil health while simultaneously encompassing high standards for animal welfare and social fairness. So, why would you choose regenerative certification? It's a standard that can provide clear and accepted definitions for what regenerative means. The certification to the standard and the audit provide consumers with confidence that regenerative organic agriculture is based on principles that must be upheld. Without a standard and oversight, consumers could become skeptical of what regenerative and organic means, and it could result in consumer confusion. Regenerative egg, and what should it be? It should be built on practices that do not rely on agrochemicals and fossil fuels. It should be based on continuously adding and improving practices that regenerate health and, car and carbon capture. It should be based on holistic approach where this total system is valued over the short-term gains. Practices such as tillage should not be shunned completely. There's recognition of its value in soil building and long-term carbon capture. As, it accompanied, as it's accompanied by practices that compensate for or neutralize any negative effects. Aim to achieve permanent capture and holding of carbon and soil, not a quick gain and release. Sorry, quick gain and quick release. So I did see a presentation not too many days ago now where they were looking at that. And it is quite interesting how organic farming does hold carbon and in the top, it can come and go, but further down it is well held. So I think there's um, 
getting to be more and more good research on how organic farmers, even with tillage, can sequester carbon in their soil. Next slide. So this is the logo for regenerative. Uh, the standard for rock is overseen by the nonprofit uh, Regenerative Organic Alliance. The ROA group is made up of experts from in farming, ranching, animal welfare, social health, and farmers and fair and working fairness for farmers and their workers. Regenerative Organic Certified was established in 2017. As a result, it's still a new project. So the next slides I'm going to show you are on the structure of certification and what is required, but it's a new project. So these standards could change as it evolves over time is what I would guess. So what and who is eligible? Products that can be certified to rock include animal or plant products for food, fiber, and textiles, along with personal care ingredients. Types of operations can be an individual farm or ranch, a multi-site operation, that involves farmer groups or cooperatives. Processors are not required to have rock certification, but this does not mean that they are not required to do paperwork. There's supply chain guidelines on the rock website that covers the practices and documentation that's required for storage, processing, packaging, distribution of rock products. When a supplier or farmer reaches the gold pillar status of rock certification, the processor must then provide additional evidence to show their facility is also meeting the standard. So just keep it on this one. Um, so this baseline certifications, to even qualify for rock, all farmers must meet the base requirement to North America standards, such as core or USDA. And it must be held by the farmer before applying for rock. Depending on the operation, a farmer may need to have more than one baseline certification. And this slide shows that baseline certifications that are, that are recognized by rock. So you can see USDA is the most prominent one here, but of course, or is also accepted, jazz, and so on. It's not about replacing existing certifications. This is about building on those baseline certifications, unifying them, and going beyond them on certain criteria. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So it's built on three pillars. We've got the soil health pillar, the animal welfare pillar, and then the social fairness. And then farmers will start out at the bronze level, and then you move through from bronze, silver, and gold. The soil health pillar as organic certification is a baseline um, for USDA, EU, etc. Regenerative criteria ask that farmers keep as much of the ground covered in rooted vegetation for as long as possible. They require a good crop rotation. They want you to use the principles to minimize soil disturbance and demonstrate that the minimum number of regenerative practices can be met. Soil sampling is a criteria of rock certification and soil samples need to be provided every three years. And I remember a long time ago when organic farming first began, there was a lot of people who thought that soil sampling should have been something that was always included in the organic standard. So I find it interesting that um, rock is doing that. So ROA's intention with soil testing is to provide valuable qualitative and quantitative information on the physical, chemical, biological properties of the soil that influence and are influenced by the agricultural practices. So it'll be a measure so you can see how you're improving over time. Okay, this third, the second pillar is animal welfare pillar. The baseline for this pillar is that you have to have an animal welfare certification that's recognized. So certified humane would be one of those. But any of the animal welfare ones must meet these five freedoms, freedom from discomfort, fear, distress, hunger, pain, injury, disease, and the animals must be able to behave in a normal way. They should be grass fed. There's a lot of rules around transportation, how long the animal can be transported. And then of course, no confined um, feeding operations are allowed. Social fairness. So with this pillar, it's important to address fair payments for farmers, good working continuous conditions, and establish long-term commitments. No forced labor is allowed. The baseline for this pillar is an improved fair trade certification, but they've decided for right now for Northern countries such as Canada and the US, there's no baseline certification required in order to um, qualify for bronze or silver. So, when a farmer moves up the pillars though, and they apply for gold or are ready for gold, a social fairness 
um, certification will be required. But during the levels of bronze and silver, there is, um, when we do the audit, we have a fair for life checklist and the inspector will go through that fair for life checklist during the audit. And so that will be maintained throughout the years. So there's then the three levels within rock, bronze, um, to claim rock at the bronze level, at least 25% of the land within the production unit must be certified at initial application and must reach 50% of the operation by year five. Or alternatively, the certified portion may represent at least 25% of the operator's um, revenue derived production. Silver, to claim silver, um, you have, must have at least 50% of the land within the production must be certified at the initial application for silver, and then it must reach 75% at uh, year five. Alternatively, the certified portion may represent at least 50% of the operations revenue. For gold, in order to claim rock at the gold level, 100% of the food or fiber producing land must be certified and 100% of the revenue must be derived from the rock certified land. Claims about rock and regenerative, sorry, about organic and regenerative organic can only be made about products that are specifically grown on land that's already certified to the standard. So you can't say you're rock. Uh, if you've grown it on something that's not certified to rock, you can't claim that when you're selling the product. It has to be from the land that's part of the application. So how to apply? So you can apply, um, you know, you can contact any of the EquiCert offices across Canada, but ultimately they'll direct you to me because I guess I've just recently become the project manager on Rock, So that'll be uh, me that you would end up talking to. And then once we connect, I basically just start you off with an email that has a bunch of information and links to the ROA website, because in the end, you end up completing everything through their website. And I, I do recommend that anybody that's interested in Rock certification, that you go to the website and you have a look. There's tons of resources and you can see all the application documents there plus just all the information about the standard. Um, once it's completed and they have a client services person who can help you, once the application has been completed, the farmer has to choose which certification body they wanna go with for the audit. So EcoCert's role really is, I you know, can initially talk to you about it. I can send you off to their website. You do all the fill in. If you choose EcoCert as your company to do the audit, then they will um, send us your file once it's complete. We review it, we send an auditor to your farm, we complete the audit, um, do an evaluation, send it back to ROC, and then ROC um, will issue the certificate. So to some degree, I can only help so much. I can provide you with a quote. Um, the quote is also important. That'll happen once you are picked up with a CB, but I do, I do think it's a good idea to talk to the CB that you're thinking about going with in advance and just ask them what the cost will be because there's going to be costs associated with your certification, um, like with the CB, and then you also have to pay, there's a one-time fee with ROA, and then there they also charge you per acre fee, which I think both of them are fairly small, but you got to pay in American dollars, and so it just... It's cost, I know, is always an issue for farmers. So it, it's, it's good to have a look at that too. So then my very last slide, what we decided to do was we wanted to ask some of the farmers who are currently investing it, because I just mentioned the cost. Um, and there is a cost. And I, I know that I heard Patty talking um, at the trader's breakfast the other morning, and he said for his small farm, all of the certifications that he's doing are really piling up now, and it's getting to be crazy, the cost. And so I do think as much as I love, you know, that rock is moving forward, I think sometimes costs can be, people want to do things, but if it costs too much, how are you going to do that? So we'll have to see how that evolves. But you can just see from these um, three quotes, two of them are from farmers, one's from Quebec, one's from Saskatchewan, and the third one is a trader. And he expressed why he was excited about it. They're currently buying for um, a buyer in the U.S. And so I asked all three of them, and I thought I would just leave it with those um, quotes for people to have a little look at, and then we can move to the discussion. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, uh, as Jennifer uh, alluded to, um, 
we'll uh, move into the second uh, or third phase, for those of you counting, into our uh, panel discussion here. Uh, and then following that, uh, in about uh, 15 minutes uh, or so, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, we'll move into general questions from uh, anybody in the audience. So make sure you use that Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen to uh, get any questions in there. And we'll just go down the list. Uh, so the sooner you get your question in, the better chance uh, that our speakers will have a chance to answer. So uh, let's just jump into some questions here. Um, uh, Andy, uh, you you spoke a little bit uh, to this in your conclusions, but I, I um, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts or, or Jennifer yours as well. Um, what connections do you see between the ideas uh, behind what you were talking about, uh, Andy? Organic 3.0 and ROC, and what are what are some of the synergies between the two, and maybe where you know where do you see some departures? Hey, thanks for that question. I, actually, I thought I might just share this um, the screen again, if that's okay. Um, since uh, I went through very quickly what the features of Organic 3.0 are. Um, so if you focus on the top of the screen, you see the six features of Organic 3.0. I, I think when we talk about some connections with um, between 3.0 and, and ROC, um, you know, the number, um, numbers one and two really, but the, the, the call for continuous improvement towards best practice is in direct alignment with what uh, I think regenerative agriculture is trying to achieve. You know, you see the, the three levels of the rock and that's really what it's encouraging farmers to do is to continuously improve and move forward um, in, in their, uh, their practices. And it's uh, organic 3.0 is also calling for the, the true um, value and uh, fair pricing and holistic empowerment throughout the value chain, which I think does link back to um, the, the rock as well. The, our current organic standards, we had a lot of discussions in the last review and revision of the organic standards about how we might bring the principle of fairness into the Canadian organic regime and our standards, but um, um, it was just too much to absorb in one big one shot. So to see rock um, moving in that direction, I think it's in alignment with what we're hoping to move towards in uh, organic overall, uh, but we need to do it in a managed way. So that's just a kind of a couple of examples from, from my perspective, anyway. Jennifer, did you want to add anything? I, I mostly, I think Andy's done quite well there. I, I think, yeah, I, I don't think I have anything to add. It's, that would be anything different. Sure. Uh, okay. Well, so out, outside of um, rock, then, when we're just speaking about regenerative agriculture uh, in general, um, wh what do you think? What role does regenerative have in the organic 3.0 movement? And does the lack of a definition around that word regenerative, which I think, as we all know, can mean very different things to to different people, uh, depending on where you stand. And so does that lack of a definition around regenerative help or hinder organic 3.0 or, uh, or other certifications like ROC? Well, I think, I do think that there is, as I'm sure most people know that there's, regenerative is really being thrown around by a lot of different um, groups now. And I think, because I touched on it in, in my presentation a little bit, that when you do have a standard, um, it's something for people to go back to and look at. For example, you know, um, a &W talks about their antibiotic free beef. And maybe because I <laughs> work for a certifier, I'm skeptical. What does that mean? Who's doing that? Does it mean they don't get antibiotics the week before they arrive? Or do they not get antibiotics for the rest of their life? You know, like, so I just think that with regenerative, when it's just a phrase, it can mean so many different things. I feel like a little bit when you have a standard and so that's where rock would be slightly different from just regenerative in general. And then as far as it compares to the 3.0, I mean, I think 3.0 is more of a, a movement or an idea that really does align well with rock. I think it is very, very similar. And I think that the advantage of 3.0 is that you're able to talk to like it's a, it's a discussion, right? Then you can discuss it. It's it's the values are very similar, whereas with a standard it's a little bit more uh, rigid in some ways and it can be changed, but then that's that association that changes those um, 
standard. Mm -hmm. Andy, did you want to add anything? Sure. I, well, I think uh, I, I totally agree with with Jennifer. I, I think we, if you look at the regenerative agriculture kind of guiding principles that people are mostly referring to, they're they're largely in alignment in terms of what they're trying to achieve with what we're trying to achieve in organic. You know, it, it's not necessarily they're achieving bad things, but um, but when you look at what regenerative agriculture is and the, the very introductory levels towards more sustainable production systems, you know, just, you know, taking small steps to adding cover crops to your fields, you know, um, are recognized and, and pretty much you're into regenerative level one. Um, you know, that those are baby steps towards sustainability and, and compared with the leap that we've made in organic agriculture in terms of our production systems, our rotation requirements and, and managing without pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. And then rock really takes, you know, it adds, so we have that minimum organic standard and it raises the bar. So um, regenerative organic is, you know, the premium of uh, organic, whereas regenerative egg at level one is the the most basic entry point to just doing sometimes what I think of what should be expected of farmers as a, a as a standard practice now so um so I think that there's um it's all moving in the right direction and I want to come back to that but there's a an opportunity to create confusion around what what really you're achieving uh under regenerative agriculture and, and that I think will be discovered more and more as uh, that regenerative ag movement grows. Do, you, uh, do, do both of you think that the organic sector should be raising the bar for performance in the organics, in the organic standard? I mean, seeing other certifications like Rock come up that are described as like, you know, the premium of organic um, you know, seems to imply that organic in, it, in and of itself is not enough. And so I guess I'm wondering what, where your thoughts are and should we be seeking to update or, you know, to continue to raise the performance metrics in the organic standard? Do you want to go first, Andy? <laughs> Okay, um, so I don't think the pioneers of the organic movement were wanting to see us draw a line as to here you're not organic and here you are. You know, they were talking about improving practices all the time in an environmentally sound and productive and profitable way and healthy way. <laughs> and, and that's, but because of um, the consumer demand and this market demand, which drew in, you know, certain expectations from consumers, but also um, perhaps some fraudulent, and we still see that issue a lot, the, the fraud to capture that uh, premium. So we had to create a standard that was a minimum standard that uh, ensured that we we're meeting consumer expectations and the values and the principles of what organic is supposed to mean. But at the same time, making it accessible to uh, farmers so that you didn't create too much of a burden and they could actually move into organic. And it also needed to account for the tremendous geographic and ecological and market variability of farms across the uh, regions within a country or the globe. And so um, if the standards were too strict or too high, it would really have deterred many people from entering into organic uh, production and adopting those practices. And unfortunately, we do need to have kind of that organic status that kind of drives people, gives them incentive to come in. That's what that label is. So we'll, we'll maybe come back to that again later for the discussion, but I'll let Jennifer comment. Sure. So I, I agree a lot with everything that Andy's saying too. I think to some degree, the, um, the Canadian organic standard, I would like to see it a little bit, um, just a little bit more robust on a few things like the pasture or prairie land shouldn't be used in organic, like that you can't tear it up, that there's gotta be a way to stop that practice. But that's just, you know, we're cutting down trees in order to then turn that into organic land. I don't think the standard touches on that. And that to me is a little bit of an issue, but that's, that's my own personal opinion. Um, I do agree though, it's, I think the organic standard, the way it is right now, it's huge for a lot of farmers. I talk to a lot of farmers to wrap their head around just even doing the basic of the core standard is like really hard for them. But the mm -hmm. thing that's cool is that if they are into it, 
and they do enjoy it and they get into it, then they might be ready for the next step, right? Like they, they see that it can work and it takes a few years and they really get into it and then they want that next standard. So I see rock as sort of that for anybody who's ready to go to that next step, then you can do that. And then you don't have to make core so onerous that people can't get in, that they can't even consider it because right now, organic production is not like it's still a small pie piece of the pie you know globally and we don't want it to be small we want it to continue so I think you have to have that base and allow people to get in that way and then we got to really get them into it give them education support them make sure that they're you know feeling connected and then they'll want to move on generally I would say most of them there's only ever a fringe number I find anyways that are conventional and are dabbling in organic just because they want to dabble (laughs) <laughs> if, I could, yeah. if, if I could comment just a little bit further on that, Stuart, you know, mm-hmm. I think if we look back 20 to 40 years ago, um, the organic standard was like a huge shift, like it was a big deviation from what conventional agriculture was. And we also, you know, and we didn't have the technologies, um, we didn't have the knowledge transfer systems available that we do now. Um, you know, the whole, all of agriculture has evolved tremendously, but the organic sector has as well. We have um, higher capabilities of, to achieve some of these higher performance goals. And we also have uh, better capabilities for tracking and recording and uh, all of our information. Um, uh, is it uh, Light Farm, uh, Farm Light, Light Farm, I think, at UBC, that's uh, the new record keeping system that's uh, being designed or being promoted, free software to, to really uh, integrate uh, organic record keeping with, um, or record keeping within the organic standards and beyond as well. So as we improve our capabilities, I think it makes it easier for us to, um, to target setting higher bars for the standard but we always have to be cognizant of that learning curve and um, so ultimately I I don't think I answered your question but I I do think that we should be working towards um, the moving towards the kind of the rock kind of platform and uh, seeing how we can integrate uh, those standards so that we can encourage continuous improvement and not just uh, uh, you know so people are aware that just minimal entry to get into the market is not really what organic is just about. It's not just a market driven thing that we are trying to make a better world for agriculture. Mm-hmm. Well, well, let, let's, let's get into the nuance of that. Jennifer, you, uh, you mentioned in your presentation and again, uh, during this panel discussion about the costs for operators, how do you think we balance this idea that you've both spoken about of trying to achieve continuous improvement within our standard uh, but without uh, increasing administrative burden uh, or costs for operators? Like, how do, how do we walk, walk that line? Okay, so one of the things I think would be a good, like, this is, of course, if I had my way, but um, I think that more buyers should foot the bill for farmers. So it, buyers often are finding the end user. They're the ones who have to fill their, you know, their... Um, contract so I think that they should pay for that um, and you know lots of times there is like if a guy has Korean certification and the buyers contacted this farmer and said you know I want you to do Korean lots of times they'll pay for the Korean certification so I feel like buyers it could be a little bit more put on them and especially with rock because the buyer doesn't have to have certification why not have him cover that cost because one of the things also with Regenita that I find quite interesting is we do have one buyer and I do have um, quite a few farmers that are with this buyer. And what they did as far as the social fairness part of it is their end user, they had conversation with that end user and they said, okay, our farmers say they need a base price. They can't go below. If the market drops below, will you still pay you know, this X amount? And the buyer was into it. And that falls under the fair for life. Like, when I first started to learn, because EcoSearch offers Fair for Life, and I said to Chris, I don't understand how we're going to implement this in Canada because most farmers work on their own. But it's setting a, a, a base level for farmers. So the farmer knows that no matter what happens, their buyer at the end is never going to go below. And if the market goes up, then that's awesome. The farmer makes more money that year. 
So I, I do think that rock can kind of fill some of those. And I think that the buyers could pay for it. But when that doesn't happen, then I don't know. It, it gets to be very expensive for farmers. I think it depends on your size then. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's complicated. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jennifer. Andy, did you want to add anything there? Um, well, I, I think that organic is really this ideal model of agriculture that we're trying to or striving towards or maybe not ideal but we're definitely moving to a higher like a higher standard in agriculture it's trying to set a unique pathway and uh, with with unique constraints you know we have to find really novel solutions to our agricultural challenges and the outcome of that as per that pedal diagram that i showed you is that we are seeing measurable multifunctional benefits of organic farming systems that are for the public good. So I think in addition to the buyers helping to pay for that, I think that um, having government support or subsidization for things like transition um, are also important uh, as because these are real outcomes that we need to start putting price tags on. It's really expensive to put a price tag on how much money did we save by not uh, allowing pesticides to enter into our environment um, in terms of environmental impacts so and health impacts and so on and of course enabling uh, farmers to uh, adopt the practices more easily through improved software and whatnot would help so great well <clears throat> i think uh we're going to move into some questions from attendees to see that our q a feature is uh stacking up with some questions here Lots of questions about ROC, Jennifer, so get ready. Uh, but our first question uh, comes from Paul. Uh, as a member of this movement myself, I'm curious how we can make space uh, within a very Eurocentric and increasingly corporate system for decolonization and partnership with Indigenous communities. Thanks so much for the presentation. Oh my goodness, that's a very tough question. And I think I would, I would lean back to the fact that I think partnerships uh, with Indigenous communities would be a fantastic way spending more time like you know we do lots of conferences and events specifically you know in big centers maybe finding ways that we can partner more with Indigenous leaders so that we can go there because we do have some like a few Indigenous farmers who do come to us and want certification but I I agree there needs to be more done um and I do think it's an important way that we need to move. And I actually, I sit on the uh, Organic Connections Board and we do a conference like Guelph's Conference in Saskatoon and we're always talking about that. So I, I think it's something that needs to be worked on, but I do also think uh, when I first started in this industry, nobody was talking about Indigenous people and the organic sector and, and now we are. So I do think it's just, just like how organics is evolving, I think who we're involving who or who's coming to it or who we need to include is also evolving. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that, Jennifer, <laughs> that, uh, you know, it begins by uh, being inclusive in the conversations and, and our, our goals and uh, recognition. Um, I, I've had a chance to go to a couple of um, IFOM conferences, the Organic World Congress, uh, and I, I really find it fascinating going to those meetings because you meet people from around the world and hear stories from around the world. And, um, and a concept referring to like the, the Eurocentric type approach to agriculture, um, that there's recognition that, by, that organic agriculture has some issues in that regard as well. In fact, it was described as biocolonialism in one of the sessions that uh, I was in where uh, developing countries and the, the agricultural south of the, the planet is, um, is, is growing crops and selling it to the developed countries in the north and uh, but not benefiting from organic, good, healthy, organic foods uh, within their own neighborhoods. Um, basically, they're growing for market export and they're not getting a fair price for it. So. Um, so that that can relate to indigenous people around the world and uh, as well that we shouldn't be taking advantage of them that's where the principle of fairness is so important but uh, the ecological view of indigenous people is so important for us to consider and to integrate within organic and, and it's certainly it's part of our consciousness um, but we need to be more proactive and and active in, in um, bringing them in 
<clears throat> thanks. Thanks so much for that uh, question, Paul. It's appreciated. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Ravi. Um, does ROC work for uh, flower farmers? I am pretty sure that it doesn't because the standard says that it's for food or fiber. Um, but I would say a couple of things about that. I, there is some good, um, you know, um, if, you're, if you're a flower farmer who has workers and you're already doing it organically and um, you want to show that you're, you're meeting some of those pillars, right? So you could have organic certification for your flowers. You could have a fair for life um, certification. And then, um, you know, there is standards like the Rainforest Alliance, or there's other ones that you could use. I'm pretty sure that rock, because it's for food or fiber, or um, unless maybe it was to go into the, because it also talks about the, like, kind of the cosmetic industry or healthcare or um, beauty products. So I would, I would also, you can reach out to the rock and ask them, how would flowers fall into this? You know, are you willing to uh, consider that uh, flower producers might like to do rock? And like I said, rock, although they have this standard, I, I get the impression that they are also trying to build on it and work on it. So at this point, I don't think flower farmers would fall in there, but I, I, it would be worth a question or investigating other types of certification that would work for you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, another, another rock question here around soil sampling. Does uh, ROC require specific metrics within the soil samples? How do these compare to uh, EOV metrics? Uh, that's sorry, that's the ecological outcome verification metrics. Um, in his keynote earlier this week, Brent Preston talked about how we're uh, still quite far from being able to effectively monitor soil health consistently. How does ROC and other those other certifications manage the ongoing uncertainty in what the best metrics are for soil health? So. Right now, like, okay, I, I don't know much about EOV metrics. Um, and the ROC has, if you go again to their website, you'll find there's a soil sampling guideline there. And I agree with you, like uh, soil health, you can test for a lot of different things. I think it can depend on what labs you go to. Um, I don't know how, how best to deal with this. And I guess ROA will have to decide how best to deal with it. But right now they have criteria for what they want you to take sample your soil for. And lots of farmers, you know, do yearly soil samples and that's what they base their decisions on and they see how their, or, you know, their um, soil biology is um, improving or not, not improving. But I think the part that I like the most about this, whether or not it's, um, exactly correct or the best way to do it is that we're at least talking about soil. In the organic standard right now, you don't have to take a soil sample. We, you don't have to know what's happening. And so at least with this, we're, it's a jumping off point and it's a discussion and you can see what's happening. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope so. <laughs> uh, Andy, I'm gonna throw a, a question at you here. Um, uh, from the chat here. Andy, how do you get this out to the consumer? It seems to me that conventional agriculture has latched onto no-till as being sustainable, conveniently in parentheses. On the other hand, there's been a noticeable expansion of cover cropping in recent years, which is good, although still terminating uh, those covers with chemicals. Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is like, I. Again, I think cover crops are absolutely a step in the right direction, and uh, in terms of providing protection to the soil, um, you know, so important, and um, and it does help to prevent le le uh, leaching of nutrients and so on. Mm -hmm. Often, the cover crops are being applied in conventional systems as a fall cover, and you know, with a spring termination and. Um, so cover crops can cover such a broad spectrum of application, it's hard to um, really acknowledge the full range of benefits and limitations of some of them. Anyway, I think that the, the challenge of uh, conventional, I, it, it's clear that by inorganic systems, if we're adopting cover uh, cropping practices and crop rotations, we're, we're definitely achieving more than uh, just what conventional systems are. And, um, I agree, it's, uh, it's hard to get that message out to everyone that needs to hear it. Um, 
and and it is um, you know financially challenging sometimes as well when you see the the canola prices out in the prairies and uh, um, farmers are trying to uh, capitalize on really high conventional market prices without all the headaches uh, that they have to deal with in organic systems and where we have to have a long-term view and have to have strong rotations that build the soil including the use of cover crops so um, so how do we get this out to the consumer that we're doing this? I think it's an uh, ongoing education program. Um, we can't just have start and stop education. Um, you know, say, hey, we are educate the consumers one year, we have a project. Uh, there has to be a continuous um, uh, in education. This is where the Guelph Conference is great because it's opened up to the, uh, the consumers to the trade show and, um, and tries to integrate them more. So. I think uh, those kinds of activities are really important. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Jennifer, I'm gonna throw some uh, rapid fire ROC questions at you. Okay. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll try to choose the ones that uh, I think are, will be straightforward for you to answer and then we'll circle back to some longer ones. Um, does ROC require livestock as part of the operation or can it be crop only? It can be crop only. Okay. Is ROC a certification uh, only available in Canada, or do you plan to extend the certification more broadly, for example, in Europe? Actually, uh, funny enough, it is available everywhere. And I actually just got the stats the other day on the number of rock certifications in North America. There was two with a few in the pipe that are still coming through in Canada. There was 20 of them in the United States. And the remaining, remaining like I think 29 of them were um, in Europe and other countries. So Europe actually is so much more ahead of us uh, in so many ways in that, I, if you remember from my presentation, I said that in North America, we're not required to have the fair for life or the, the uh, social pillar. And it's, it's kind of because of the way farming happens here. But even in like France and Germany and, and lots of those countries, they already have a social um, certification that they're working on. So in those countries, and then of course in more developing countries, because there's lots of workers and they're often farmer cooperatives, then they also apply for those. So uh, rock in Canada is actually just in its infancy, but I can see that there's a big strong interest in it. And in other parts of the world, it, it seems to be happening more rapidly. Okay, a couple more questions here. Uh, does ROC take into account proximity to markets or distribution requirements? Uh, like, so you're maybe asking a little bit about like how far, how far, how far how the products far travel. Has to travel. I think so. Yeah. No, you know, and really, uh, that could probably be the fourth pillar that maybe one day should be added would be the climatic impact, and I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's what you're kind of asking in a way, um, and no. There is no, there's no restrictions on, outside of shipping animals, there's restrictions on how long they can be in the in transport, but other than that, no. And finally, a question from Eva H. Uh, does the ROC, uh, what is the ROC allowance regarding the use of man manure from non-organic livestock farms? Oh, that is a very good question. And I actually don't know the answer. Um, but if you do go to the website, because I don't have to, um, because I generally don't deal with the very specifics. Once people start with ROA, they um, deal with them about those. But I'm pretty positive that if you go to the website, there's, there's one on manure there. Because I know under the Canadian regime, you are allowed. There's certain criteria around it, but I'm not sure about rock. Sorry, I am kind of new to it too. Sure. All right, uh, maybe a question for uh, both of you here. Uh, Ralph Martin asks, how much nuance do you think consumers can accept when shopping? They could be discerning whether to buy organically certified or RC bronze or ROC silver or ROC gold, you know, with a different price maybe for each of them. What, you know, like what kind of a system do you think we're, we're leading towards for consumers by having all these different certifications? Do you want to go, Andy? Sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's an interesting question. I think that ultimately the um, dedicated organic consumer is, uh, is going to look at the word organic. And even if they don't understand the different levels of regenerative 
or even just have a regenerative organic uh, certification, they'll see the word organic, they'll continue to relate to it, and they'll continue to buy it. That, that's kind of my, uh, my guess. Um, the more interested and educated organic consumer might go deeper and try and figure out what regenerative is and what the levels mean. But the fundamental is that they'll learn that the baseline is always the meeting the organic standard. This is distinct from the general regenerative standards, which um, with their different levels, um, it's a whole different ball game, I think. And uh, so I, 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 I am thinking that uh, the rock standard would be easier to implement because people will still clue in to that word organic. And even if you're the casual consumer, um, they will associate organic with something of certain value, a certain value proposition in their mind. And, and they'll buy it even if the word regenerative is in front of it. So I don't think it'll be as complex or difficult as what we might think. Sure. Jennifer? Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think in general, most people now know the difference between organic and something that's not organic or it doesn't have the organic label. So I think consumers have gotten to that point where the majority of them realize that. I think by adding the regenerative, I'm hoping that it'll just spur people on to want to know more. And I don't know how Rodale is planning to, like I know Dr. Bronner's is part of the board. I would assume that some of their big key players in this standard are also going to be promoting Regenita. And as it becomes more known, just like when we started out with organics and lots of people had no idea what that meant, it evolved. Consumers learned, they figured it out. And I do think consumers are becoming more and more interested in where things come from. And what it means. Uh, another question here from uh, Carolyn in the chat: How can we make uh, the Canadian uh, sorry? How can we make Canadian organic standards better integrated into ROC? It seems like there should maybe be an easier audit process that recognizes both the costs and the higher standards of uh, COS. I assume compared to NOP. Um, uh yeah is that uh, is that a clear question for you jennifer is that there should be easier audit process to recognize both the cost and the higher standards um i think because right now you sort of the current because uh, organic certification is the baseline then yeah. there's a separate inspection and separate process for rock to get stacked on it really an administratively easier process would involve you know some kind of a dual approach to be doing both at once. Uh, and I, I guess, right. what, are, what are your thoughts there? So, uh, you know, th this is one of the things about that if you do go with, say, EquiCert, for example, uh, and you do your core with us and your rock with us, as long as you have all your paperwork in for both, um, both standards, then we'll we can send one inspector that would do both at the same time. So, uh, as it grows, I can see that EcoCert would be able to then, for their clients, say, we can do it all at once. We can reduce the cost on this because it means we don't have to do two trips. But if you're certified with another certifier and then you, you want to do um, rock with us, it's unfortunate that then it ends up having to be two, two different audits. Mm -hmm. um, so... I think over time, and as maybe there's more certifiers who get approved to do it, then that should, as with everything, right? Like as more and more people get involved, it should drive the price down to some degree, I'm hoping. Yeah, Andy? For, for, for me, I think that um, it begins with, um, you know, our organic standards go into revision every five years and uh, it, that time flies by. We just had our 20, 20 you know standards and everybody's taking a breather but um you know the talk is already happening if we want to prepare to integrate uh, new standards or make some significant revisions um, we need to start talking about it now and i think that there's um you know we, we could be having some really clear strategic conversations around how we um integrate the regenerative standards or within organic or within the core. Um, I, I would be open to those kinds of conversations. I don't think there's any harm in trying to demonstrate that, um, that we are moving towards better practices always and, uh, and how, or at the very least being more prescriptive in what we're doing. But uh, 
to, to achieve certain outcomes. But I think um, we got our work ahead of us as a sector to if we want to make some changes. Otherwise, we're looking at 10 plus years down the road um, for real movement in this. Uh, and uh, uh, one final question from the uh, from attendees here um, about uh, farm start here. We are starting uh, starting from zero on a mine uh, reclamation site. Do you feel we can start with ROC and skip other certifications like organic? We want to create a baseline of, and have outcomes verification over a long term. Thanks, David. So uh, no, you can't you can't start without organic certification. So that was one of the things is that you do you do really have to start with um, core if you want to uh, move into rock. They won't let you start in rock without it. It's definitely one of the solid criteria. Um, I'm not sure if you're maybe when you say that you want to create a baseline and have outcomes of verification, like depending on where you're at with the mine reclamation site, if you're if you're thinking that um, you know the soil is suitable that you can move into organics even with organics it takes 15 months um with, under core before you can even be certified um i would assume depending on how they've reclaimed it there's going to have maybe have to be some soil samples done there anyway so you could start your baseline um yourself but as far as rock is concerned you do have to start with organic and then you can move into rock so you only need one year under the core and then you can apply for rock but you do have to start with so Jennifer, would you describe rock as an outcome-based standard or is it a process-based? Because my impression is that it's still, um, it's still process-based in terms of the evaluation and whatnot. It's not just purely measuring whether you've increased soil carbon or improved certain soil health parameters or things like that. Is that am I correct in that? Yeah, I think at this point it's still sort of process-based. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think that potentially that will evolve is what I'm guessing. And I maybe uh, we're almost out of time here, but uh, maybe we have time for one last question. And, and I guess all, all this uh, you know, has made me wonder whether sort of looking 10 years into the future, do you think that um, ROC is going to push the general Canadian organic standard um, more towards the type of uh, metrics and evaluation framework that ROC has? Or do you think we'll just see more people certifying to ROC um, and the same baseline of organic certification? And, and what, are, what are the two of you think about sort of looking forward at the future, how ROC will impact organic certification in Canada? Mm. Go ahead, Andy. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see us integrating more so that we capture efficiencies and the nuances. And, um, you know, if we come back to Organic 3.0 and our, you know, understanding that the world is changing very rapidly and we need to be, uh, if we want to have a unique value proposition in the minds of consumers, uh, producers, and policymakers, we need to be evolving and moving forward uh, in our organic standards. And, and right now, you know, I don't know that our standards are evolving and moving fast enough. We're trying to keep up and we're on this, this treadmill where we're trying, we're spinning our wheels sometimes trying to just keep up with inputs and, and GMOs and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think that we, we really need to sit down and, and re-envision our standard. Um, so that it's moving forward. And, and Rock, because you still maintain that baseline of the organic standard, USDA or Rock, um, Canadian organic regime standard, it's a, it's a nice, it, it gives us an opportunity to, to expand and, and add value or continue improving what organic means. Jennifer, any, um, any, any final thoughts to, to Andy there? Yeah, I mean, part of me would like to say that you know, core could evolve into being rock and, and, you know, maybe that would be a great way to do it too, because then still at the base, they, we follow the similar model at your bottom tier would be basically where we're at maybe with core right now. And then we would push forward with it. And then that way, as far as like costs for farmers and audits and things like that, maybe the standard could evolve that way. I think it's great. I think rock puts pressure on everybody else. And the great, the difference too, is that 
for core, it's a, you know, it's a federal standard that then has to, you know, meet equivalencies around the world. The thing about rock is because it's a private standard, they can kind of do it how they want, <laughs> you know, for the most part, they can create their standard. And I mean, I'm sure to some degree that there'll have to be equivalencies if they want to, you know, for other countries, but they do have the ability to change their standard based on their board. Whereas we do have to still meet certain global criteria and equivalencies and there's a little bit different pressure I think on a national standard but I I think it's great pressure for core the board of core to see what we could do better um, with our current standard because we can always make it better I think yeah great well I, I think that maybe is a, a nice place to to leave our conversation for the day I uh, want to give a, a very sincere and hearty thank you to Andy and Jennifer for both being here on a Saturday uh, afternoon to uh, share their experience uh, and knowledge with us. And a, uh, a special thank you to this session sponsor, sponsor EcoCert. Um, our uh, staff is sharing um, a couple links in the chat with everybody right now, uh, which is uh, a link to some feedback forms for this session and the conference in general. Uh, we would ask that you uh, take a brief moment to give us your feedback. It really helps improve the, conver uh, the conversation in the conference for future years. Um, and uh, as this is the, the final uh, session for this year's Guelph Organic Conference, what a quick six days that was, I want to thank you, uh, thank everybody for attending the 2022 Guelph Organic Conference and let you know that recordings of all the sessions will be made available and uh, distributed to all of our attendees uh, in, the, in the next week or two. Um, and uh, we will send those out via email through your uh, same uh, email that you just to register. Um, as this is our final session, I just want to take a very quick moment to recognize someone who's been very instrumental in this year's conference. Uh, Jane Kreider is a staff member at OCO and has been uh, totally critical in organizing and executing this year's Guelph Organic Conference, um, doing just about everything uh, there is to do. Jamie there in the video. Thank you, Jamie. This year's conference would not have been possible without her efforts and long hours in ensuring the whole thing came together uh, as well as it did. So uh, Jamie, a very sincere thank you on behalf of OCO and all of our session attendees and the GOC team. Thanks for all your work. And thank you again to our speakers and for everybody being here today. I hope you have a wonderful Saturday evening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Look forward to seeing you next year in person. <laughs> <laughs> have, have, a, have a wonderful night, everyone. All right. I'll just keep the session open for a second, just in case people want to copy any of the links in the chat. Thank you all for being here.